Okay, friends, well, let's get started. And uh, this is uh, going to be a discussion on astrology and yoga and destiny, free will, and basically anything else that we find entertaining during this time together. But to get started, let's do a double part chant together. And I invite you to sing along with me, um, or at least, actually, you may not know the lyrics to this one, but this is a very traditional hymn. Well, so now we know the answer to that question. It's okay. <laughs> we can just pull that aside in a second. But um, one of the questions that often comes up in astrology is, supposing that astrology is real and that we can see indi uh, indicators of our karma in the display of the planets and stars, then the natural question becomes, well, what can we do about it? And actually, this invocation has been used for thousands of years to invoke the grace of the universe. And it is an ancient, ancient hymn. And it's also con uh, deeply connected to the planet Jupiter, who is the protector of mankind and the bringer of all things benevolent into our lives. And it's often chanted traditionally to begin an event and to ask for the blessings of the universe. So I thought it would be particularly appropriate to begin with this chant together. I'll sing first in Sanskrit and then an English translation. And I invite you to close your eyes, and if you happen to know, sing along with me. And if you don't, just try to not just listen to the melody, but to feel for the vibration which has been imbued with spiritual power over the course of thousands of years. And countless sincere devotees chanting this chant to invoke the grace of the universe. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Deva Maheshwara, Guru Sakshayat Param Brahma, Asmaya Shri Guru Ve Namaha. Ramanandam Paramasukaram Evalam Vyanamurtim Dandwati Tangagana Sadrisham Atvamasya Dilakshyam Ekam Nityam Himalamachalam Sarvade Sakshi Bhuttam Bhavati Tam Triguna Rahitam Sadgurum Tanamami Full of bliss Giving joy transcendent Of higher knowledge the abode dual no more clear as the heavens known to all as thou art that he is pure permanent unmoving the everlasting seer of all far far beyond qualities and thought guru lord i bow to thee guru lord Let's listen to this song written by Swami Kriyananda. I thought this would be a fitting introduction to the study of the science of astrology, a song of divine soul yearning. I have a love who is far away. Have a love who's far away, farther away than the stars. 
stole in my heart away, heart away, heart away. And yet she stole in my heart away, farther away than the stars. Keep me not bound, no, teach me to fly far from earth's madness, free ere I die. Keep me not bound, no, teach me to fly far. Let's hold ourselves still and upright for a moment of meditation together, diving deeply within ourselves, retreating to that inner oasis of perfect peace that resides at the heart of our own consciousness at all times. So already today, my very favorite magic trick has occurred, which is I love when I begin a class with a chant, I close my eyes, and when I open them again, change your presto, a few more people have materialized out of the ether. It's a magnificent thing. So I'm happy to be here with all of you today to get to begin our yoga retreat with such a fun topic as astrology. I think the weather will uh, disallow me from using that, so we'll just put it to the side. So our discussion today really ought to begin with the simple question of what is astrology and how does it work? Um, so by a simple show of hands, um, who has had an encounter with uh, Vedic astrology before? Just to get a hand on the room, pun intended. Okay, so most. Okay, so in essence, Vedic astrology, this is the quick, the quick uh, debrief, is really just the science of... Uh, studying the patterns of energy which exist within you at birth, which are painted by the orientation of the stars and planets at your birth. And what's really important to remember about astrology is that astrology does not create your karma, but that, as Swami Sri Yukteswar puts it, who is a great astrologer, an exponent of yoga, an avatar, and a masterful astrologer, he writes that man takes birth at that precise moment when his individual karma is in mathematical harmony with the universe, which is to say that we're born at the place and at the time that we need, at the place and time when it's needed. That way we can experience those events and things that are necessary to encourage our spiritual development in a natural and harmonious way. And that harmony is the underlying essence of the universe. And so it's not so much that the planets and stars impose themselves upon us, 
but that rather we naturally are born at the time when the tapestry of the world is painting a particular picture which happens to look like us. So then the art becomes not so much of wondering, is astrology influencing you, but asking, how are you influencing you? Because we all bring into this life a host of karmas brought over from other incarnations, that basically we are not a clean slate, that all of us bring with us samskars or past memories and a momentum that has been developed over many, many incarnations, and that through the science of astrology we can glimpse some of that momentum, some of those skills that we've brought in, some of the tendencies or the fears even, or the uh, even just the simple karmas that uh, you know a, a typical astrologer might be able to tell you when you might be married or when you might inherit money or things of this capacity. But what's interesting, just to say, that the way I've been trained to pick up astrology and the way that astrology most interests me is less predictive by nature and is more interested in asking the questions, how? How did this karma come to be? How did I become the way I am today? And most importantly, how can I become the version of myself that I most desire to be? Because really, we also have to ask ourselves, are you currently now the zenith of what you think is your true potential? Do you think that what you're currently experiencing is the highest point capable of human consciousness? Well, I hope not. Certainly for myself, I can't speak for you. But so really what astrology becomes then is a roadmap to understanding ourself and a roadmap to understand really in essence what is the highest version of yourself in a way who were you born to be not in a um, fatalistic sense but really as an invitation to remember uh, your true soul potential which can be indicated by astrology but not uh, not necessarily fulfilled by astrology now, to circle back, how the heck can that possibly work? Well, we could talk at length about the subtle astral anatomy, which is really the heart of astrology. And we'll talk briefly about it here together today. But if you have more questions, that's what the Q&A is for, which we'll have in just a few minutes. But to get into it briefly, um, the exponents of yoga state that this physical form which we inhabit is actually the grossest manifestation of who and what we are. And that at a subtler level, we are beings of energy. And that even physicists are beginning to agree to that, that we're not just, you know, this bundle of flesh, but that we are moving energy. And that even matter itself seems to be nothing but energy. And so what the yoga science declares is that this physical form is the final expression, the grossest expression of who and what we are. And that at a subtler level, we are currents, patterns, and flows of energy. And that even subtler than that, we are thoughts, that we are committed to certain concepts, thoughts, ideas, a consciousness, ultimately. But all of that trickles down until eventually we create this physical form because our consciousness is not yet fully evolved. We haven't yet realized ourselves to be at home with the entire universe. But that's where we're going. But so then here becomes the interesting thing. Yogananda, my guru, said that everything in the physical world is a symbol for a divine reality and that actually nothing in the physical world has any meaning in and of itself and interestingly enough he said the sun which is of course the most powerful prominent thing that we can perceive with the bare senses and that the sun is constantly producing so much power literally that if we could harness even just a micron of what it is giving to us we could power the entire world over a million times but so the sun in all of its splendor and all of its power yogananda said is just a symbol for the spiritual eye for that sixth chakra which its quality is light and that he said the light of the spiritual eye is brighter than a million million suns but it is a gentle light that does not burn your eyes it's really something to consider but so then what becomes very fascinating is that our solar system itself becomes a reflection of what they call in the vedic science the cosmic man and at the center of our solar system is the sun and that in the human body is reflected by the sixth chakra the point of highest consciousness in the body and but the sun has its feminine dual which in our case is the moon 
And the moon represents the medulla oblongata, which is the first cell that is created in the human body when sperm and ovum meet. And that represents an astrology, which we'll come back to, our individualized ego. But so already we see a lot of wisdom reflected in the science of astrology that they say within each of us there is the blazing light of the infinite, the sun, the perfect soul realization of who and what you really are. But that each of us also has a moon, which has no light of itself, but can only reflect this borrowed splendor from the infinite. That's our little ego. That's our little personality. The only trouble is most of us tend to think that we're the moon and we forget that the sun even exists. So really the whole science of astrology is teaching us to how to get back to that sun. But then we, there's a lot more to us than merely those two planets. And so what becomes very fascinating is the next planet closest to the sun is the next chakra closest to the spiritual eye. Mercury is the king, the lord of the throat chakra, who's famous for communication and articulation or uh, education, things like this. Then we have the next planet in the solar system, Venus, who presides over the heart very famously. And then at the solar plexus, the seat of fiery self-control, we have the fiery planet Mars. Exactly. And then at the sacral center, the reproductive organs we have, now we're stretching out into the outer planets, we have Jupiter. And we'll talk more about him in a little bit. He's a very important planet. And actually, when the sun goes down tonight, look to the eastern horizon. The brightest star you see is Jupiter. It's quite prominent in these, the night sky right now. And just about two weeks ago, he was the closest he's been to Earth in about 50 years and was incredibly bright. So he's still fairly close, but uh, very close, in fact, and is very beautiful to behold. So pop outside this evening when Asha is speaking out in front of the mandal, and uh, you'll see Jupiter rising over her back probably as the evening progresses. And then at the base of the spine, the last of the visible planets with the naked eye is Saturn, the lord of dharma and of karma and the personification of the earth element in our bodies but so all of that to say vedic astrology takes the planets not as powers in and of themselves but as symbols for the chakras which each of us already have and so the planets only have any power to exert over you because actually all they're doing is activating energies which already exist in your own self. And so it's so the, the question of does astrology rule your life or do you rule your life? Well, of course it's you who rules your life, but guess what? You set the ball in motion. And so as the ball goes out, so it will come back. And the planets merely help to give a lawful method for the law of karma to act itself upon you. That for every cause, there is an effect. For every sway out there is a sway in and the planets just help to create the waves of cosmic energy that bring this reality into existence and basically that what's what's really fun actually is in the vedic science they say that like i said the whole solar system is one cosmic person and that each of the planets represents the chakras but then we talk about the constellations well actually the constellations are just the chakras or the planets personified into two different expressions, a yin and a yang, that there is the principle of duality at play in all of creation, that in every form and every at the heart of every vibration of energy, it is expressed in a masculine and a feminine way, or a yin and yang. And so the sun and moon are yin and yang. They are the married couple, so to speak, of the, of the solar system. Mercury expresses itself in a masculine way through the constellation Gemini and in a feminine way through the constellation Virgo. Venus expresses itself positively in the constellation Libra and in a more receptive way in the constellation Taurus. Then Mars, the great warrior, we have personified as Aries and Scorpio. Aries likes to race. He likes to go fast. He likes to grab life by the horns. So when I see someone wearing a Red Bull racing cap and saying they like to race, I'm thinking, oh, we have a Mars man in our midst. Okay. And interestingly enough, I was sharing at the beginning about a friend of mine who grew up and was a very self-declared person. And he ended up uh, being a professional racer. And here's some interesting things. So as an astrologer, I'm always watching and looking at people because everything in the world is created by an admixture of the energies within ourselves, uh, with an admixture of the energy of the chakras and the energy of the planets. Then everything is just a combination of that light. And so if someone personifies a particular planetary ray very strongly, I should be able to see it in them quickly. 
And so here's some fun factoids. They describe Mars as being red, fiery, tempered, athletic, powerful, and impatient. I'm not trying to call you out, Luigi. <laughs> but so it's very interesting. My friend, who is was an incredibly gifted athlete, was a race car driver, was a, an all-star track athlete, and was gifted at anything he decided to do. He has bright red hair and is of incredibly red complexion and was quick to anger. Mars. You know, it's easy to see. And then who here is familiar with uh, the wonderful friend and god Ganesha? Who's seen Ganesha? A picture of Ganesha before. Yeah, we've all probably bumped into him. He's got to be around here somewhere. But um, that is a perfect personification of the planet Jupiter, which we'll touch more in later. That Jupiter is often depicted as being a little bit fat because he enjoys life and that he's easy. But most importantly, he's the giver of gifts and that he is the purveyor of grace. And so Ganesha is often propitiated for removing our obstacles and bringing grace into our life. And what's wonderful about Ganesha as a personification of the Jupiterian principle, I love one of the things I love about him is he helps you like whether or not you deserve it, which is so lovely. He's sort of like the, the really... Um, benevolent uncle who doesn't mind if, you know, maybe you didn't study as hard as you ought to on your homework, he's going to help you anyway. And that's Jupiter's principle, is just that goodness rules the universe and that he's going to help you expand and grow even if perhaps you could have worked a little bit harder. So at any rate, it's a fun practice for me as an astrologer to try and listen and feel for the reality of the planets in all daily life because actually they're really whispering to us all the time. And I'll tell some more stories about that a little bit later. But now coming to back to the essential topic. So does astrology influence our life? Well, on a certain level, yes, it certainly does. That I have looked at a client's chart and accidentally been able to predict down to sometimes the day, some life events that occurs. And the funny thing for me is I usually talk with someone and I try and get into a flow of, I pray very desperately to my guru to help me be an instrument of truth. We do our discussion together and then usually I don't hear from them for six months or a year or sometimes never. But then what's always interesting, and I don't hear from the people who like things go terribly wrong most of the time, which of course must happen. But sometimes people will write to me and will say, oh my God, I got engaged on exactly the day you said I would or blank happened exactly when you said it would. And I write back and I say, it's not the fact that I said it, it's just the fact that your karma was strong enough to materialize it. So, but now, yet the question remains, does astrology influence us? So I'll tell a story from my own life. So I got interested in astrology when I was just a wee boy. Now here's a little interesting tidbit. Does anybody know how many years it takes for the planet Jupiter to complete one solar cycle, one cycle around the sun? Anybody? Oh, you're real close. Yeah, it's a little lower. Twelve. Twelve. That's right. Twelve years. So then, has anybody ever read the Mahabharata or the Ramayana before? Yeah. So in the Mahabharata, the Pandava brothers are banished for twelve years, plus one, for good measure. And the plus one is that they have to remain in secrecy and be undetected by the enemy. But they're banished for twelve years. This is very symbolic that they're banished for a cycle of Jupiter, and that it's actually interesting, you may discover that your life expands in 12-year rhythms. That even for a natural, for a child growing up, when you hit 12, you begin to hit puberty, you begin to wonder more about your self-identity. Usually at 24, we're just graduating college or whatever, we're trying to stride out into the world and discover who we really are. 36, we probably have some children, we have our fixed jobs, and we're starting to really be a contributor to society, and so on. So at any rate, it's an interesting phenomenon. But right before my Jupiter returns, all of a sudden just a little seed popped in my brain and I became hungry for astrology. And as it happened, my dad knew a little bit about astrology, so I studied with him. One of my, my sixth grade teacher was a, was a um, amateur astrologer, so I would stay in at lunchtime and we'd talk at a chalk shop on astrology. I was like, wait, what? And I was trying really desperately to wrap my brain around it. And for my 13th birthday, I asked my parents for a reading with my now mentor, Drupada McDonald, who is one of the foremost astrologers of the world today, in my opinion. And uh, he, it was very interesting. 
When I sat and I had my first reading with him at 13 years old, he had never met me before. He only looked at my chart and he began talking to me. And he described my inner experience of life and he described how I perceived myself more accurately than anyone had ever been able to understand me before. It was overwhelming. I actually started getting a headache for the almost the entirety of the reading until I realized after 90 minutes, the reason I had a headache was because I was trying to keep him out of my psyche. And then I realized, why? He's helping me. So I relaxed and actually it was very interesting that reading he gave me, he predicted a number of things that ended up coming to pass and he was able to help me make some very important changes in my life. But at that first conversation, my mother was also present and she asked some more typical questions that one might ask an astrologer and that a mother would be interested in. Things like, what will Keshava do when he gets older? What profession should he go into? And what was very interesting was my mentor actually sidestepped those questions. And he said, I'd rather not say. I think Keshava has strong enough will to determine whatever he wants to do. And my mother tried to pin him down to say something and he evaded. He actually sprinkled a few hints, which turned out to be real. But Here's another interesting thing. This is very important to how we ought to approach astrology. And I'll, this is just a first touch of it, and I'll come back to it more later. But my mother asked him, he said, Keshava struggles a lot with anger and has a really, um, t has a really hard temper. And it often comes out in his speech and in his words, and he can be very hurtful. And it's a real problem. And immediately he jumped in and he said, it's not a problem. This is one of his greatest strengths. And as he gets older, it will reveal itself to be one of his greatest blessings in this life. Be patient. And then instead of beating me for having that tendency, he told me how to work with the energy. And he encouraged me to, instead of repress it, to cultivate it, to sharpen it. And what's interesting is it has become, that same energy has become one of the most powerful, most life-saving, helpful qualities that I possess. And it was very interesting. He looked at me and he said, that same sharpness and insight which you have, which helps you to devastate people in an argument, what if you use that instead to help them? What if you looked at someone, understood them, and nudged them to be better rather than to be worse? I work as a counselor now. It's exactly what I do. And then he said, what if instead of hurting people, you encourage them? What if instead of demanding that other people better, you demand of yourself to be better? Well, now that's what I do. But then, of course, the question ultimately becomes, he said, and what if instead of telling other that there is deficient, why don't you try and understand what truth really is? And he sent me on a quest to really try and understand what is truth. And he sent that planet that he was referring to was Mars. And Mars is the divine warrior, but he's also the divine aspirant. And so rather than quelling its energy, he just directed in the appropriate way. And then all of a sudden, guess what? I'm less tempestuous in my temper now. I'm much more self-possessed. But so was that my astrology or was that how I related to my karma? But more on that later. So it was very interesting. My mentor approached astrology very much as a mutable thing. And think about it like this. Or if I were to ask you, who are you? Like, what are you? What kind of person are you? You might tell me, oh, I'm generally like this. Or if I were to ask your wife, she might say, you're generally like this. You're generally like that. But then don't we all recognize that we have good days and we have bad days? And there are days when we are charming and magnetic and loving and personable. And there are days when, we're, you know, we're kind of crabby. But yet it's the same person, right? And there's such a spectrum of consciousness that's potential within each of us. Well, there is a spectrum of consciousness that is potential within every horoscope as one would think, obviously, if you were to just think on it. But what becomes so noble is in astrology, that potential, like I said at the beginning, is all the way to the heights of the very zenith of what you could be. And a good astrologer can look at your horoscope and basically encourage you to become the saint that you were born to be, or the, the Mahatma that you were born to be, that perhaps you glimpse in the deeper points of your meditation or your hatha yoga practice or those moments of great equanimity in nature or so on and so forth. And that's what astrology is really encouraging you towards, is what were you really born to be? But so then flash forwards. I cultivated a love of astrology. I tried to study it. I tried to understand it. And I watched as it occasionally wrecked havoc in my life. 
Um, there is a uh, little esoteric tidbit here. There are periods of time that each of us go through in our horoscope, which an astrologer can help you analyze and understand. And there is a predictive element that one can anticipate the rhythms of life that you'll go through and the lessons that you're most likely to learn in different periods, as anyone can identify retroactively, but sometimes it's nice to be able to see it before it hits you. And my birth time is incredibly accurate because being born to a family of yogis, when I was born, literally someone in my at my birth, their only job was to jot down the accurate birth time as soon as I took my first breath. So as a consequence, my birth chart is incredibly accurate um, and sometimes can be frighteningly accurate in its predictions. But uh, I broke up with a my then girlfriend of six years, which was a very serious relationship on the day, the exact day that something in my horoscope changed to indicate divorce or separation. And I didn't even see it coming. I should have as an astrologer. But then all of a sudden it happened and I looked down at my chart and I thought, oh my God, I'm like, there I was. I walked right into that one. So there is, of course, an element of the chart being able to indicate things that are coming. Because like I said, it's just a the Jala shows is the karma that which we ourselves have already put into motion. But so anyway, flash forward. Now I am 22 years old. I'm living in Los Angeles. I am a budding young amateur astrologer. I'm enjoying the science. I'm also teaching uh, Raja Yoga, Hatha Yoga, meditation and philosophy. And I go with a group of my friends to, Los, to um, Little India there. And we bump into a really charming astrologer from India. He's been practicing his entire life and he offers, he says that he does readings for free and that he would love to do all of our readings for us. And, you know, we're sort of out on a Saturday and we think, sure, that sounds like fun. So one by one, we go in and he does a reading with us and I walk in for my turn and it was such a perfect experience. I hope I never forget it as long as I live. I come in, he's sort of pensively looking at my horoscope. There's silence. And he looks at me and he says, you had a failed relationship in 2006. And he goes back and I'm sitting there going, to and I think, well, yeah, but I was like in high school. So I don't know. Sure. Great. Okay. Yeah, that's true. And then he looks back at the chart and he looks at me and he says, last year you inherited great land and property. And I said, no, I didn't. And this is my favorite part. He said, yes, you did. Like, excuse me, um, I was there, actually. It, it didn't happen. No, no great land and property. And then he became really confused, and he looked again at my chart, and he said, oh, that's very bad. That's very bad. This one malefic planet in your chart is burning up your inheritance. You should have inherited a lot. And, you know, that's not a very happy thing to hear from anybody. But then I'm looking at him, and I'm like, there's no wealth in my family. Like, I don't understand how that would have come to me, even if that were the case. So I told him, listen, maybe you're right, but I'm not seeing it. So then he looks back at the chart and he looks at me and he says, in the summer of 2020, you'll become a father. And I was a renunciate. I am still yet a renunciate. And at the time I was earning so little money, I couldn't afford to buy socks. And I'm, I'm not even joking. And I, I sort of balked at that. And I said, I, I, I don't think that's in the cards. And all he said is, it is a blessing, accept it. Uh, <laughs> and things went on like this. And then finally, at the end, he said, do you have any questions? And I thought, well, God, what's like the one question I can ask that will surely give me a good answer that I can actually utilize in my life? Because up until this point, we'd sort of just been, you know, miss after miss after miss. And so I said, well, I've dedicated my life to serving my guru and his mission and trying to help as many people as I can. How can I better serve his mission, his work? And he consults my horoscope and he says, um, you should become a businessman. Like I'm thinking maybe you should get into canned goods and maybe you can make your millions and then you can donate a lot of money to his organization. And I just thought, my God, like I, maybe this guy got the wrong birth chart or something, but we were like, oh, for five, you know? And so, but then what was really bizarre was I walked out of that reading and every of my, every single one of my other friends loved their conversations with him. And I thought, am I just crazy or was that totally wrong? 
But it really got under my skin because I was trying to reverse engineer some of the things he was saying and I couldn't quite shake it. And then maybe I was thinking, well, geez, maybe I will be a father. And who knows? Maybe canned goods is pretty good, you know? So there I was. I was thinking about this. And then finally I went and had a conversation with my now mentor, Drupada. And what was really fascinating was we went back through and what my astrologer said was he said, actually, all those things he said were not wrong. He was just misinterpreting who you are. Because remember, every energy can be expressed at any level of consciousness. And what was then interesting was he said, let's talk about first the example of inheritance. What does inheritance really mean? It means that you are being blessed by an older generation. And he said, wealth, land, and property. So I looked back in my life, and actually the date that that astrologer said I would inherit land and property, I didn't inherit land and property from my earthly family. I inherited responsibility as a custodian of my guru's mission. And I started being one of the center leaders of Ananda in Los Angeles. I inherited land and property. Then what was very interesting was he said, you'll become a father in the summer of 2020. Of course, at the time I was reverse engineering this, it was still 2018. I was a little nervous. And my astrologer said, well, there's a lot of interpretations we could take about the word father. It could mean that you take responsibility for helping other people, or you might work with children, or you might be also the word father is really just a symbol for the sun, which is to say you might be helping to shed light in people's lives. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that's, that sounds pretty good. Okay, I think I can handle that. So then here's what was really wacky. 2019 rolls around, and all of a sudden January of 2020 comes Summer of 2020 is right around the corner, and I'm thinking, it's only four months away. There's no pregnant women, so I'm doing good. Um, until a woman came into my life who did her very best to uh, engage me in romance and very nearly succeeded, and she had two children. I could have become a father instantly in the summer of 2020, and I was considering it for just a moment. But then I realized again that that was not the way that my karma would express in this life. So it was very interesting. Astrology was knocking on the door. That man's predictions were almost true, but I consciously chose to express them in a different way. Now here's the interesting thing. So I consciously choose, I have this opportunity, do I want to get into this relationship and become a father? And I decided I don't think that's my dharma. And I prayed very, very sincerely to my guru, guide me, guide me, guide me. And I never felt that that was the right thing. Well, flash forward just another six, nine months later, all of a sudden I find myself volunteering at a local private high school. And here's what's very interesting. After just a few weeks of being with them, I helped on a field trip with these high school students. And I was walking with a, with a group of the young men. And we were walking to a rock climbing gym. And I've just spent a few weeks with them, just a few hours every week. And we're walking in and all of their parents had to electrically send, uh, electronically send in release waivers. And I said, okay, you guys, all, you, all your parents sent in release waivers. Otherwise, and they said, yeah, 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 we did. And one of them said, well, I don't know. What if mine didn't go in? And I said, listen, if anyone's release waiver didn't go through, y'all just became my sons. And that's just the way it is, right? And what was so sweet, I said it as a joke, and it's a very mixed race group of kids. And so like the, you know, it would have been preposterous for me to propose, you know, nobody would have believed that I was all of their fathers. But what was so sweet was instantly one of the boys said, well, that would be wonderful. That was one of the more touching things that anyone had ever said to me. But it was also just a confirmation that suddenly that energy had blossomed in me without even intending it to happen. All of a sudden, there were six young boys who were looking to me as a father figure after just a short period of time. And so I had become a father, in a way, in 2020. So, at any rate, that brings me to then again the question, does astrology affect our lives? Well, it does. How much does it affect our lives is dependent upon the level of energy that we ourselves bring to our lives. And this is an incredibly important thing to remember because there were more than one baby. There was more than one baby born on May 26th at 3.13 in the morning, right when I was. But only one of them is standing right here. 
There are more, you know, interestingly enough, Napoleon Bonaparte, his chart is generally known and is, an, is a, a case study often used among astrologers to show different um, analytical components which make a king or make a great ruler or a general. And he's got them in spades. I mean, he's got them written front, back, side to side, all over his chart. It's the sort of chart that if an astrologer looked at it, you'd go, oh my God, who is this? Well, it's Napoleon Bonaparte. We would expect as much. The guy was a tyrant of Europe and actually almost did some really good things, but got a little too inflated with his ego, which interestingly enough is also very clearly emblazoned upon his horoscope. Can't hide anything, unfortunately. So, but yet there were certainly other babies born at that precise time, yet no one is as famous as he. And interestingly enough, actually, the one general who really finally dethroned him General Arthur Wesley from England also has a surprisingly powerful horoscope. I mean, like the man almost took incarnation to make sure that Napoleon didn't conquer all of Europe. But what's interesting to think of is there were certainly other people born with exactly the same horoscope. Why don't we know their names? Well, and the answer, I believe, is simply because each of us, the karma that we bring into this life is like a stained glass window. But the vividness and the brightness of that image is dependent upon how much light is coming through it. That no matter how glorious a stained glass window, if there's no light on the other side, it looks dark. And similarly, if it's covered in soot and ash on the front, it doesn't matter how much light you blast through it, it still appears black. And so really the whole study in the science of astrology is trying to help you realize that the stained glass window of you and you and you is magnificent, that it's so beautiful, that it's the most incredible thing that's ever been created. And all we have to do is wipe away some of the soot and shine a little bit more light through it, and you will realize that. And that's the whole science of yoga. That's why we practice hatha yoga. That's why we practice pranayama. That's why we meditate. That's why we're here. That's why each of us keeps coming back to our yoga practice because somehow we feel a little bit more like ourselves when we get up off of that mat, don't we? How? Why? Why does that work? Because we're more than just this little physical body. We're more than what we have been, but we are going somewhere magnificent. And so... In Vedic astrology, when rightly interpreted, it doesn't show a declaration of what you will be, but it gives an invitation for what you might be. And that if we bring a subconscious energy and nothing but habits and go through life unconsciously, which let's face the facts, many of us do most of the time, then Vedic astrology can very accurately predict when you're going to tie your shoes, when you're going to get fired from your job who you're going to marry and when and how long the marriage will last and all of that. But the minute that you begin to apply the greatest gift perhaps that God ever gave you, which is your own will, you begin to recreate your horoscope and you begin to redefine how it will be manifested. And that to me is the most exciting part of astrology is to ask, what does it promise and how can I take a step towards becoming that? So now I'll pause for a little bit because I've been going, doing my happy little thing for about 45 minutes. So I'll tell one more self-revealing bit and then I'll ask, I hear some questions from you. The Mars that my astrologer alluded to is in my second house of speech. So once I get a nice head of steam up, he can just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And, talk. and we have to like pull him off into a little side, you know, eddy and let him spin around a little bit to give other people a chance. So any questions so far? What do you guys think? Does this make some sense? Okay. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, the roadmap, yeah. is it also the language of the stars that the uh, astrologer is able to, through the systems and through the uh, intuition, uh, understand the language of the placement of all uh, stars and planets. Yeah, I think, so I, let me see if I rightly understand your question here. It seems like you're saying that, you know, the stars and planets are constantly whispering to us. In other words, they're the a language created by God that then some people can be. Definitely. And I actually really appreciate um, the idea that we're listening to that because 
The planets and stars are very much alive. Their consciousness is real. And uh, again, now just sharing from my experience of astrology, my mentor is very atypical and that there is lots of treatises written on the rules and the techniques of interpretation. And they'll say that when you have Mars and the moon conjunct, it's called this. And when it's in this house, it means this. And there's lots of rules. Like you can actually just create software that analyzes all of it. I've done it before. And then like, for example, when you analyze my chart in that sense, they say that I will own a hundred elephants and you know, 500 chariots. It's very impressive. And uh, they also say things like, I will have an affair with my teacher's wife. Hasn't happened yet, but I got to watch out. So, but, but so, of course, there's a limit to analysis and there's a limit to rules. But really, of course, we have to go back and like, who made those rules? How did they come into being? And actually, what it really boils down to is, like you said, intuition. And it is a language and the planets are talking to us. And so, too, are the stars. And now, from my own experience, what's interesting is my mentor, when he accepted me um, and we began our official training together, one might think that I would first memorize all of those tomes and rules and names and all these exotic things. He didn't let me do a single thing of that. He gave me one book and he said, read one page of a description of the planet of the day of the week because... If, for example, in Spanish, lunes, that's the moon, martes, Mars, miércoles, Mercury, etc., etc. Jupiter rules Thursday, Venus rules Friday, Saturday rules Sunday. And guess what day rules Sunday? The sun. So he told me for every day of the week, read one page of description about the planet and then meditate on it. And he said, do that every single day for a month. You'll meditate on every planet four times have an inner communion with it. And then we also need to remember that the planets are a reflection of our chakras. So what he was also telling me was go deep in your inner meditation, in your sadhana, and meet the spiritual eye. Commune with the spiritual eye. Ask of it for its wisdom and listen. And then he said, come back and talk to me and we'll compare notes. And so I did that. And then he said, okay, good job. You've done that. Now your second assignment is do that for the constellations which remember are the polarized expressions of each of the chakras. So he said, okay, you think you know Mercury. Now do you know Mercury when it's expressing as Gemini? And do you know Mercury when it's expressing as Virgo? So now go do that. And if you do every single constellation, you'll do that three times in a month. Okay, so off I go. And then I come back, starting to feel like a hot shot. Not really. So we're two months deep. And he says, okay, that's great. Now, can you tell me what Sattvic Mars is like? And I think, I, think, I think to myself, maybe. And he said, there's very few examples of Sattvic Mars in our world today. The biggest, most powerful Mars is that we're aware of, even in our media, Thor, God of Thunder, or you know, pick any football player. That's not Sattvic. That's very Rajasic, violent. How many examples of true Sattvic Mars do we have? Few. So then he sent me back to the drawing board. Okay, well, I have to go find the Sattvic Mars. What does that feel like? And then he said, what does Tamasic Mars feel like? Okay, well, I know that a little bit more. But now there's a whole spectrum of possibility. And then the real art, then he says, okay, so now you think you know what Sattvic Mars looks like. But what does Sattvic Mars in Taurus look like as opposed to Sattvic Mars in Virgo look like? I was like, I don't know. So we go back and we meditate and we pray. But here's the interesting thing. This becomes so overwhelming. I could try and meditate like that for a lifetime, and I still am, and I still wouldn't know a thing. But here's, here's been the secret for me. Desperate prayer. Desperate prayer. And what was very interesting was the way my mentor forced me to work was with direct inner communion with these vibrations, with these rays of energy. These expressions, these ninefold expression of universal consciousness, that Mars represents a ray of consciousness, which in itself is a path back to infinity. And the closer you get to infinity, the less it looks like Mars and the more it looks like God. But yet that is a particular ray. So here's a little side story. I was praying very deeply, trying to meet Mars, because he's a very prominent character in my horoscope, and one might as well get to know him and I'm an astrologer, so I need to. And I was praying 
over and over. I was doing japa to Mars. I was trying to get to know him. I took a week-long seclusion, which is just in silence. I was meditating many hours. I was alone, and I was doing lots of japa to Mars. Now, here's the very interesting thing. The planets dance around the sky. That's actually why they're called planets. It comes from the Greek word, which means the wanderers, and so they wander through our solar system. And when I was in seclusion, the planet Mars was in the constellation Pisces, which uh, he's actually fairly well placed there. But during my stay, he took a step across the line into his own kingdom, Aries, where he's very strong. And during my seclusion, because I'm a nerdy astrologer, I found out what day that was going to happen. And so the morning that it was going to happen, I sat in a long meditation. I really meditated. I prayed all this. And then I didn't really feel much. So I got up off of my meditation bench and I went. And of all things, I was actually taking a shower. And all of a sudden, I could feel a divine presence entered the room. And it was the only way I could describe it was imagine the most powerful warrior king standing in the presence of the room with you, blessing you. Just like endless, radiating courage, dynamism, power itself. Not power to destroy, but power to rise. And it felt like a true darshan. It was almost overwhelming. And I noted the time, and the moment I felt that had been the moment Mars had transitioned into Aries. And so now I know a little bit more about what Mars in Aries feels like. I'm still trying to find out what Mars in Virgo feels like. But I met a sattvic version of him. He came and introduced himself to me. And now when I read a, a client's chart, I don't go study a book. I pray. And I sit and I go talk with my friend. And his name is Mars. And when I talk with a client, it's kind of like I say figuratively. It's not literally, but it's almost there. I can almost feel it. It's like behind the client, I see my nine friends. And they're arrayed there. And my job is to look at the client, to feel their vibration, and through them to feel my nine friends. And to ask my nine friends, who needs help? Who wants to tell me what? And sometimes Mars will speak because I have a close connection with him. And he'll say, you should tell them this because this could help. And I could work with that. Sometimes Saturn will step forward. And now, so now my job is to make friends out of all nine. And that's uncommon because each one of us in our birth chart has certain planets that are friendlier than others. But for me, I have to make friends with them all, even the ones who are most challenging. And Saturn, who is the famous lord of challenges and obstacles, uh, he's been raking me over the coals for about the last 10 years. It's been great. You know, he's, um, he's obliterating my impurities one test and trial at a time. And uh, let's see here. I think I've got about another two and a half years of it, and it's been about 10. So I'm almost through. So you can root for me of the last two and a half. You know, I'm kind of coming out of the tunnel. It's getting better. But at any rate, a couple of years ago, right after he w had obliterated my work, taken away my best friends, destroyed my longtime relationship, and basically shattered every other self-identity that I had, um, I was, you know, I, I, the more I tell these stories, I get a little embarrassed because it seems like my most profound revelations happen in the bathroom. But <laughs> actually, I was saying that to Asha and she said, no, no, that's a very real thing because you stop trying so hard. You're just so relaxed. So like things happen. <laughs> but so there I was and I was walking into the bathroom and I was praying and I, I said to Saturn, like, why are you being so hard on me? Like, why? What are you trying to teach me? But it was actually a question. It wasn't a complaint. I was actually just asking, like, what, what are you doing here? And instantly I felt the vibration of Saturn and I felt his response, which actually has completely changed the way I relate to him now, which was one of compassion. He actually basically told me, he said, I'm like a surgeon. You have cancer and I'm the only one who's willing to put you under the knife. All the other planets are too scared. They don't want to hurt you, but I want to help you. And you're going to squeal and you're going to scream and you're going to say that it hurts, but it's this or you die. And so ever since then, I try not to run from the knife. But if that's what he's holding, all right, Saturn, perform your surgery. But that's taught me a lot about him. 
Now, another interesting thing, because you mentioned that it is about listening to the divine script, being able to appreciate its vibration. Um, it was very interesting. I um, Black is one of the colors associated with the planet Saturn. And it's a very popular color in our culture today. But from an astrologer's perspective, most people probably shouldn't wear black. Blue, better. Black is a little tough. Unless you're like, you know, highly focused professional. But then like when you get home, take it off. Wear something a little more relaxed. But so at any rate, I didn't wear black seriously for about a decade because I was sort of avoiding Saturn. And one of my mentors really strongly told me, don't wear black. I was like, okay, I won't wear black. So at any rate, all this time passes. And then one day, my um, someone gave me, of all things, it's really silly, but they gave me a black t-shirt. And I felt, you know what? I'm on good enough terms with Saturn. I'm going to wear my black t-shirt. So I wore a black t-shirt. I had gray jeans on, blue shoes on. Now, you might think this is really stupid, but bear with me. And that afternoon, I had a client. And as I was preparing for the client, I looked down and I suddenly realized, oh my God, I'm dressed like Saturn. I'm in all black, black and blue. These are all his colors. And I thought, how odd. I've never dressed like this in the last 10 years. And that client walked in. I looked at his chart and I instantly knew why I had done that. Because Saturn was trying so hard to get his attention that the man was breaking was destroying his life by not following common sense and good principles. And I could see the planet Saturn and I just suddenly felt the, that that ray of energy was trying to communicate with him. And the message was basically, buddy, you better really consider your motives here. Otherwise, you're going to have some serious prices to pay. And it was a very interesting thing because it wasn't me talking to him so much as just being a messenger for what was already emblazoned in his own karma. Coincidentally, actually, he's doing much better now, which I'm very grateful for, but I don't wear that black t-shirt anymore. So yeah, it's very much about listening. And it's very much about trying to feel because everybody's planets manifest themselves differently. I have met many people with Saturn in Cancer, and it's always different person to person. I have met many people with Mars in Aries, and they manifest it differently. And so it is about listening to the planets and it's about listening to the person and listening to what they need at this time and what is appropriate for them. Because now here's another little interesting tidbit and then I'll, I will let you ask me more questions, but this is just too fascinating. I can't let it slip my mind. So my uh, software can calculate the orientation of the stars and planets um, based on any given time. And so that's how I'm able to create your birth chart. You know, you tell me you were born here at this time, at this location, and I can tell you what the night sky looked like, which is really cool. And I can actually render it so like we can go look together and like, oh yeah, look, there's Jupiter. So at any rate, um, just for fun, because I, I wondered, you know, if all these people are born, like, you know, millions of people are born every minute, all these people share the same horoscope. And then I thought to myself, you know, it'd be really interesting as if I go back in history and I find a day that's very similar to my horoscope. And if I found someone who is famous, who was born on that day, I could kind of see what my karma would be like reflected in a different time. And I thought that sounds really kind of fun. And again, this is the sort of thing that nerdy astrologers do. So my software can search backwards and forwards in time for particular orientations of planets. It's a really useful function that I can just tell it, for example, when's the next time Jupiter is going to be in Cancer? And it'll spit out and it'll say 2027. It's just nice to know in case I tell someone, you'll probably be married when Jupiter goes into Cancer, which is, oh, by the way, 2027 or whatever. I don't generally make predictions like that just as an aside. But at any rate, that's what the function is for. But so I looked at that and I thought, well, this will be fun. So I put all the planets of my own horoscope and their relative signs. Okay, so Mars is in Aries, Moon is in Sagittarius, we got Sun in Taurus, bop, 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 bop. I put all the planets over there. Now, mind you, a astrological horoscope can be differed, can be changed dramatically by the passage of a single minute. Now, what I was asking my software to find was any orientation when the planets were within 30 degree variability within one constellation. So I didn't say it has to be in the 29th degree of Sagittarius. I just said, put it in Sagittarius, right? Okay, you with me? So I said, okay, now search backwards in time for this orientation of the sky. And I'm thinking, I might find one in the last hundred years. I watch it and mind you, it's scanning every second 
of every day and I can watch it and it's going brrrr, and it's scanning back and I see it search back to 1900, goes back to 1850, goes back to the 1800s, it goes back to the year 1000, goes back to the year zero, it goes back to 2000 AD, I go get some coffee, I make some toast, I come back 36,000 years later, it still hasn't found a duplicate to my birth chart within the 30 degree variability. 36,000 years. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the yugas, that's one and a half cycles of the yuga system different. No duplicate. I haven't even run it. Like I, I don't even know if we could find a duplicate or how long it would take. That'd be a good question for a mathematician or my computer if I just like let it run for a weekend while I go, I don't know, cycling or something. But the well, reason I say that is again, we take incarnation at that exact moment when our karma is ready to be expressed. And so, you know, people say, you are an individual expression of divinity. Well, you really are. And this incarnation is unlike any that you've ever had before and unlike any that you ever will have again, in that it's, per it's perfectly unique. So yes, every time we look at a horoscope, it's a unique moment of this soul's long journey through time and space back to its own infinite understanding. Okay, any other questions? That was real fun. Yeah. Uh, going back to when you, you talked about the, the different uh, planets as, and which chakra they're associated with, and I was curious that Jupiter is all, you know, all the way down the second chakra. Mm. Um, and I've, of, I've often heard, you know, Jupiter called the guru planet. Mm -hmm. So I always kind of expected that it would be like one of the higher chakras. You know, yes. <laughs> it's like, so I, I just wonder if you could, you know, go into that a little deeper. You and me both, Mark. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So does everyone know what the word guru means? Or have you ever, have you heard that tossed around before? You know, we hear like, oh, he's a social media guru or whatever. Well, it's a little bit of a, an unfortunate usage of the term. It can just mean simply teacher. But actually what it means is the dispeller of darkness. And, an, and another way of interpreting it would be um, that the guru's vibration is God's grace helping our consciousness to expand and to eliminate darkness. And that's actually the function of Jupiter. And here's, but so here's the interesting thing. All the planets can be accessed on many different levels of receptivity. But, so if the main function of the guru is to expand your consciousness, not by pain, but by joy, what's this one way that he could do that? Well, as my astrologer, my teacher put it, okay, so let's say that you're 16, you're 18, and all you're concerned about is you. That's one. Now, if you decide that you accidentally fall in love and you want to get married, that's wonderful. Now one has become two, and now you have to consider two in your life. That's a self-expansion of 100%. That's very good. But now what happens when we have children? Now you have another. And of course, you actually have a son, and you can speak to this firsthand. But how many parents say things like, I never knew what love was until I held my son for the first time. Or I never knew what sacrifice was or what purpose was until I had that moment. And I, am, I bow before the tremendous power that that function has to expand our consciousness. And if it weren't for having children, I think many people would not expand so much in their lives and learn what selflessness is and learn what joy is that joy is service and joy is self-forgetfulness and so jupiter is brilliant because jupiter's whole function is to help you to grow without it's like you know like if you had a really good teacher in school and he makes you learn without realizing that you're learning that's what jupiter does that he's like oh you love your son so you'll do anything for him congratulations you just grew spiritually and you didn't even realize it that's what Jupiter's function is. Saturn is like, go do your homework. Life is hard. Go do your sadhana. 
But Jupiter is like, God is joy. Let's just have a beautiful time. So Jupiter is also, Jupiter's main philosophical approach to life is to tell us that everything is divine. And so this is another thing that in philosophy, they'll tell you one of two things. There's two approaches to the infinite, either to say nothing is divine. Turn your back on everything, renounce everything because it's all false. And the other way is to say everything is God. Everything is divine. Everything is a symbol for something more beautiful and everything can help uplift you. That's the, that, that's the conversation between Saturn and Jupiter. And actually they're both true. It only depends on which way you prefer to learn. I know which way I prefer to learn. The stick hurts. I like carrots. And so I'm in the camp of Jupiter. But Saturn's raking me over the coals, like I said. So I get both. But so Jupiter helps us grow without even realizing that we're growing. But ultimately, when we want to cross beyond the boundary of merely a material expansion, then he becomes the Satguru where then his true goal is to expand our consciousness beyond the limitations of this form, truly. And um, so it is an interesting fact that, yes, he is associated with the second chakra, but then even there, the second chakra is related to the element of water. And what's one of the great metaphors of God is being an ocean, and that we are but a little drop of that infinite ocean, and that our soul's journey is like the little drop which is left in the mountains, which has to find its way back to the sea. And so ultimately, the experience of the second chakra when perfected, as Yogananda put it, is I am the bubble, make me the sea. It's the experience that you are one with life. And so then we could go even further to say that the, one of the characteristics of water is that it blends instantly with another body of water when it's placed in contact, or that it becomes the shape of the vessel that it's poured into. And so then we learn a lesson about the most sacred of all divine arts, attunement by that relationship. That if we would attune ourselves to the highest of the divine, we should allow the water of our consciousness to merge with that of the Guru's consciousness so he may make us infinite itself. So yes, it's a lot of wonderful things to ponder and consider, but this is also why we need to relate consciously to our horoscopes because we could take for example, I'm going to pick on you because here you are. Your son is your son, but he's also a symbol of Jupiter's blessing in your life. And every time that you interact with him and every time that you try to give your best to him, you're cooperating with the Jupiterian grace that God has given you. And if you do that more and more consciously, you'll feel God's uplifting power, I believe pulling you upwards and teaching you who you really are and what you were made to be in that. And coincidentally, since the son is here, your father is more than just a human father. He is a symbol for the infinite father. And we can all relate to our human symbols in a higher, deeper way. Much can be gleaned from this. So it's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Yeah, good question. Anyone else? Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's a very good question because much hoopla can be made of the exact time that you were born. Um, well, that sort of depends. Um, if you're in a rough ballpark, a lot of astrologers can sort of work with that. Like if you say, I was born sometime between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., but you know the rest, that's probably good enough and we could refine that. But if you don't know your birth time at all, don't worry. Lots of other people have been in the same problem and solutions have been derived. Uh, and basically, there is some highly technical techniques to reverse engineer your birth time based on your life events. And so you can actually go to some astrologers. I know one who's become quite adept at this and famous for it that uh, basically you sit down with him and you give him a laundry list of your life events and he'll reverse engineer it and tell you your birth time. Uh, it's, it, you'll speed along if you can get him close, like even within the month or whatever of your birth, um, even the year will do. So that's possible. It's tedious. Um, it's a science. It's an application of the Vedic science that I myself have not yet 
dived into and I may never in this incarnation because frankly, it's really tedious. Um, and I just don't have time for that. But there is another technique, which is actually very interesting and is just worth sharing because it's fun. It's called Prashna astrology. And basically, every single moment is unique and has a particular ray of divine energy flowing through it. And interestingly enough, there is an old Native American axiom that within a hundred feet of every poison, there is the antidote. And so, you know, if you're bit by a rattlesnake, the idea is there should be the antivenom within a hundred feet of you. Now, I'm not going to go test that. Snakes kind of scare me. But, and that's actually also in my horoscope, but another conversation. But so there's a very interesting technique that you can actually create a horoscope based on when you ask a question of me. And so you might come and you say, I have a question. Boom. Right now, 514 on October the 14th is when we're going to create the birth time of that question. And we can interpret it based on that, which is actually a really interesting thing to do. You can also create, now that I'm just on that, you can create birth times for when a marriage begins, for when a business starts, for uh, when you meet someone for the first time, all these sorts of things. As an astrologer, I'm always interested when I meet someone. Like, have you ever met someone and you feel like, oh my God, I've, I've known you before? right? Or like, hello, old friend. I do that. And I'm like, hello, old friend, you know, <laughs> because I want to go back and look at that chart. But so, yes, we can do that. That's a, a really highly effective technique in the hands of the right astrologer. But really, ultimately, the most convenient thing to do would be to reverse engineer your birth time, which is a function that can be performed. Yeah. One, one final very interesting tidbit is if we know your birth day, even if it's not the birth time, uh, you can actually interpret the chart based on the syllable of your first name. And now, uh, this sounds crazy. I, th I thought it was crazy too. But what gets wild is when you look at Madonna's chart, her ascendant based on her birth time looks a little, mm, you're like, I'm not sure about that. But when you read it from the syllable ma, it looks right. And so it's very interesting that she changed her name to Madonna and her career exploded. So sometimes people changing their names to have stage names, the name actually is partially what helps give them the success because there's a lot of power in a name as well. And it's the date that you're putting on that persona. So anyway, fun question. Does that answer it for you? Okay. Yeah. I just want to make a comment how interesting you were talking earlier really about black. Where yeah. Black. And I don't... You gave me a reading a couple of years ago. Sure. And you mentioned that Saturn was coming in February of this year, I believe. Yeah. And I just thought as you were talking about black, I have been so averted to black. I, I don't have any, I don't want to wear any black clothes or any <laughs> dark clothes. And I'm wondering if it was when that transition happened, because I can't recall when, but it's been quite at least this whole year. Mm. Is that, is that yeah. related to that? Sure. Yeah. So the planets transiting through your chart will definitely sensitize you to certain characteristics and might make you a little bit more averted to uh, Saturn's influence. So yeah, we could take a look. I can't remember your ascendant off the top of my head. Wait, I actually think it may have. Anyway. So, um, yeah. But so yeah, we should we should take a look. And if it's it, coming up in February, Saturn will transition into Aquarius. So um that may change its influence in your life. That's true. Um, what you could do, though, is on Saturdays, um, chant some Mahamritam Jaya mantra, which is a great mantra to help mitigate Saturn problems. And then if you really want to get into it, you could chant 12 for yourself, 12 for a loved one, and 12 for the world. That's a really good practice, too. Because one of the great ways to get out from underneath Saturn's thumb is to help others. It's one of the great techniques of overcoming his karma. So, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Any other questions? Is it possible for Saturn to be really a good thing for a person? Absolutely, yes. So some charts, Saturn actually becomes the, the most benevolent planet. But Saturn's always a little bit tough. He's always a little disciplinarian. So even in the best sense, he's like duty and dharma and uh, perseverance or you know, qualities like this. Of course, at his highest level, he is personified as Shiva, who which would be, you know, perfect inner peace. 
actually. That would be really the lesson that Saturn is ultimately trying to teach all of us is, who are you really? What are you? What is it of you which endures? Saturn is also called the king of time, and he represents death. And Saturn, as the king of time and the king of death, is constantly about to yank away what we think of as everything that we are. And we're afraid of that. But really his lesson, which he teaches us over millions of incarnations and millions of scattered corpses of our previously inhabited bodies, is that we are not that. I cannot die. As it says in Swami Shankaracharya's incredible mystic poetry, no birth, no death, no caste have I. I am he, I am he. And this is why, again, we meditate, that you go inside and you find that deathless part of yourself which cannot be destroyed. This is what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the soul cannot be slain, it cannot be perished, it cannot be burnt, it cannot be drowned. It is eternal. And so absolutely, Saturn in, this high, in some of the senses, Saturn teaches the most important lessons that life can offer. And so that's why, for example, myself, I try not to resist him anymore. Okay, you're trying to teach me the one thing that I want to learn, how to be unattached and how to be at peace in myself. Sounds pretty good. So yes, he can be a great friend. He can also be a tough teacher. And so all of us have a negotiation that we make with him and how to learn to uh, benefit from his tutelage rather than be crushed underneath it. So... Uh, but definitely some people excel with it. And for example, in Napoleon Bonaparte's chart, his Saturn is um, one of the most important elements that gave him a lot of power and prominence over other people. And unfortunately, he misused that. So, But um, it gave him enormous strength. Um, yeah. So anyway, good question. My brother and his now wife both have incredibly strong Saturns and they are some of the hardest working people I know and are building a bright and beautiful new future by the sweat and hard work of their own hands. That's the blessing of Saturn and so on and so forth. Yes. We're saying that Saturn is like, what was the word you used? Prominently placed or, yeah. or like, well, like, like yeah. what sign is like robust? Like, yes. Okay, so this is fun. Um, Saturn is considered to be in his position of maximum strength in the constellation Libra. But don't worry, there's no quiz at the end of this, so you don't need to know that. Uh, but that's actually, it's an interesting thing well worth considering. As, a, as an astrologer, we need to ask why. And again, this is, what my, this is what my mentor always makes me do. Like I read in the book and I'm like, hey, look, Saturn's exalted in Libra and this person has Saturn there. So it's strong. And he like, pump the brakes, kid. Pump the brakes, Mr. Mars and Aries. Why? Why? And I was like, well, 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 I don't know. And he's like, go meditate on it and then come back. Well, what's interesting is Saturn is known as the king of Dharma, which could be translated to righteousness or fairness or impersonality. Libra is the most social constellation. That is how we relate to other people. It's also... And so Saturn is most powerful in Libra because when used properly, it helps us to relate to others fairly and that it helps us to be righteous in our interactions with others. And that Saturn in Libra, yes? Oh, becomes he becomes like the righteous king or the, the, the dharmic judge or someone who places service before themselves. And so then, so Saturn is very, very strong there, but Saturn is also, it's uplifting for him to be in a Venus constellation Libra because he loses some of his austerity because also Saturn is a bit self-negating and uh, can endure a lot of tapasya or austerity. But so in Libra, he realizes that there is a balance necessary. Uh, we need to balance beauty with application. We need to balance the needs of others with the needs of ourselves. And we need, most importantly, to balance the needs of the material world with our spiritual needs. And so then Saturn becomes the great arbiter of all things, and he helps us excel. But in Libra, he also is softened a little bit by the presence of Venus. And actually, it's also interesting that that means that Saturn rises to this point in the body. And here, so we're across with, now this is, you got me tangenting. This is great. And there's, this is really like, this is the meat and potatoes of why I love astrology. Because Saturn represents on one other way of thinking of him as our essential desire for security. It's a big word. We want security. We want permanence. We want safety. And Saturn finds his home primarily at the bottom of the spine in the earth chakra. How many, how do most of us try and find security? We've got to have enough money. 
I got to have a nice house. I have to make sure my marriage is working out right. And I got to make sure that nobody dies. Well, guess what? None of those things are going to happen. It doesn't matter. And so, but what's interesting is when Saturn rises to the heart, he finds his ultimate security. That he finds that his security is not in things, but is in principles. And that his security is actually in the heart. That when he learns to develop faith, and that he learns to realize that the most enduring things in life are non-physical, but are devotional. And that he says, Lord, I lay my life at thy feet. He finds the ultimate security and he finds the protection of the infinite at his side. That's when Saturn becomes the strongest. And so, for example, this is a really interesting analogy for the fact that it doesn't matter if your Saturn is in Gemini or if your Saturn is in Aries. We all have to learn the same thing, how to find faith and true fixity and true security in God. That's really the lesson of Saturn. And it, the astrology teaches us that by placing its exaltation in Libra and placing its debilitation in Aries. Because Saturn in Aries would say, I will create my own security. Good luck. It's never going to happen. But so now if we were also talking technically, Saturn would be extremely well placed in the constellation Capricorn, which is a hardworking, initiating Earth constellation, which Americans love. Basically, Saturn in Capricorn's motto is, I'll do it myself. Just, it can be done, I'll do it. Hardworking, works 120 hour weeks, has no social life, and gets a divorce because he's never at home. Saturn in Capricorn can be a tough master. Saturn in Aquarius is also considered to be extraordinarily strong. Aquarius is personified by the quest for impersonal wisdom. So Saturn in Aquarius personified today might be a scientist studying the universe or on the deeper level might be a devotee seeking to understand truth and so on and so forth. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Yeah, so like if your Saturn, let's say, is placed in Aries, which is not a, a, a comfortable placement for That's a good word. It's not comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and so what's the lesson that it's... Is your Saturn in Aries? <laughs> 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 okay. Well, so here's an interesting thing. Um, Okay, so in astrology, there is a birth chart. It's just literally a depiction of the sky at the moment of your birth. But there's also, also mathematical calculations of the chart to show subtle, um, subtler energies there. It's called the Navamsha chart. It's the most famous, perhaps we've heard of it. But what's very interesting to me is in some of its positions, in the very nadir of Saturn's power in Aries, it actually has a glimmer of perfection. And that in its mathematical, in the Navamsha chart, Saturn is actually considered exalted. And so, for example, we could say Saturn in Aries, that first thought might be, I'll do it myself. But then, if we took that thought actually to its deepest level, we would ask, well, what is myself? What is this self? And then you realize, I actually am completely self-sufficient. Not because I think I can manipulate the material world, but because I am complete in myself. And so for someone in with, with Saturn in Aries, they might do well from practicing the affirmation for contentment. I am complete in myself. I am whole in myself. The joy and perfection of the universe await discovery within my inner being. Because if that Saturn in Aries can discover that, he'll want nothing more. And Aries likes self-discovery and adventure. And there's no greater adventure than the inner adventure of self-discovery of who and what you really are. And Saturn wants you to understand and embrace what is real, not what is superficial. He'll be very happy if we're going inside. And I know that you are. So you're working well with your Saturn in Aries. Any other questions? Everyone's like, darn, I wish I knew my chart. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hmm. So something that also is worth mentioning is in a, in the science of astrology, you'll go to an astrologer, they'll tell you this, they'll tell you that, even with me. But the question becomes, well, what am I going to do about it? Because like, you know, I have Mars and Aries. What am I supposed to do? Or I've got Aries, I've got Mars 
or Saturn in Aries, I've got Mars in Aries in my second house. So like, should I just take a vow of silence? That would last all of about 24 hours. So what, sh what should I do? And really the art of astrology becomes helping someone understand how to work with the energy which is already present in them to help it refine to their highest octave. But how do we do that? There are stepping stones along the way. There are techniques that we can implore and employ, sorry. But so for example, I had someone come to me who had uh, the sun was the most powerful, most important planet in their chart, but it was a little underpowered and they love to do Hatha yoga. So like you don't got to think too far afield. What should they do? How about some Surya Namaskar? Just do some sun salutations. And as you do sun salutations, doesn't it generate an incredible power and vitality in the body? That's one of the side effects of a powerful sun. Now, here's another aside. So I entered my sun period in 2020, hence the prediction that I would become a father. My sun is considered to be really kind of pinched because of a few things. But um, I didn't want to be perturbed by that. So I took up the Gayatri Mantra. Are we all familiar with the Gayatri Mantra? Ancient powerful mantra to one of the personifications of light, cosmic light in the form of the goddess Gayatri. It's a tremendous mantra, so powerful. And I took that mantra for fun and I repeated it about six or seven hours every day for about 45 days, just while I was working, while I was driving, while I was doing everything. It was just constantly in the back of my mind. And it transformed the way I related to the sun and to the way it related to me and the way I related to the quality of light, and so on and so forth. So the question often becomes, when you go to an astrologer, they might tell you, you're going to have a hard time having children, you should put on a pearl. And so we sometimes administer the use of gemstones, which is coincidentally why I'm wearing a pearl. But gemstones can actually be very helpful. I can tell you a host of incredible and completely outrageous stories about their effects. Um, and from my own life and from the lives of others. Uh, even sometimes, for example, one woman who's a close friend of mine, um, her daughter was struggling to have a child, and she, she, the grandmother, now grandmother, went to my mentor and said, my daughter is struggling having a child. He said, put on a yellow sapphire. She puts on a yellow sapphire. Two weeks later, her daughter's pregnant. It's like, Pfft. actually, speaking of pregnancies, there's one other outrageous story woman goes to my mentor. She doesn't even mention that she and her husband are unable to conceive. He looks at the chart and says, you might be having a really hard time conceiving a child. And if that's the case, you should put on a stone for the planet Jupiter. Because her Jupiter and her son were too close. And the thing about the son is he's really a great guy unless you get too close to him. And then you kind of get burned up. And so when any planet gets too close to the sun, they're turned to ash. And Jupiter, as we discussed, is often an indicator of children and sometimes more so. And so the sun, the Ju poor Jupiter was getting burned up by the sun. So Ju my mentor said, put on a yellow sapphire or a yellow citrine. It will help your Jupiter. You might be able to conceive a child. So this woman then goes, and she wrote all this up as a testimony. It's un unbelievable. She puts on a yellow citrine. Two weeks later, she's pregnant. She carries the pregnancy up until the sixth or seventh month. And then because of some bloating in her fingers, she takes off the yellow citrine. Now, it's not as bad as you might be thinking, thank God. She takes off the yellow citrine and the next morning, her whole body is covered head to toe in a full body rash. She goes to the doctor. They say this is a one in 10,000 thing that sometimes happens late in pregnancies. There's literally nothing we can do. The only thing you can do is deliver that baby. It's just, it's a reaction that your body has and it is very uncommon, but there's nothing we can do. So she's, th and it's incredibly uncomfortable and painful and her body just feels like it's on fire. She goes home that night. She's really upset about this. She remembers that citrine. Wait a minute, I took off that citrine. She puts on the citrine. The next morning, the rash is gone. <laughs> One of the common side effects of a yellow, of a two scorching sun are rashes. So she puts on the yellow citrine. She carries the baby to term. They have a beautiful child. A couple years later, now here's the weird thing. She takes off the yellow citrine. 
I was like, why? Why did you take off the citrine? So she takes off the yellow citrine. A few years later, they want another child. So she puts it on. It works like magic. They get pregnant again. And then guess what? At six months, she pulls the citrine <laughs> off again. She gets the rash. Wow. She goes to the doctor. The doctor says, I can't believe this happened to you twice. That's like one in a million. This never happens. The only thing you can do is wait for baby to come to term. There's nothing we can do. She goes home. Same thing. She puts the ring on. It's gone. So, yeah, sometimes these gemstones can do some pretty outrageous things. And I've seen it happen in my own life and in the lives of other people. But you don't have to race out and go buy gemstones. Guess what? Your sadhana, your spiritual practices are doing exactly the same thing. There is a spiritual sadhana, a spiritual practice for each of the planets that I just recommended a Mahamritam Jaya mantra for Saturn. You can go do that. Everyone can do that. I can teach you it right after this if you want. When you do hatha yoga, depending on how you go about it and what sort of postures you do and the attitude you take, you could be really working with any of the planets, particularly in meditation, of course, would be the, the great balm of all. But there are specific mantras, techniques, practices, attitudes, just approaches to life. Even one person came to me and they said, I, I really want a reading. I just, I feel so... Uh, terrible and I said I'm not even going to give you a reading just go like join a gym you don't need to talk to an astrologer and their life is getting better now but at any rate um, but one thing that I just delight in because gemstones are expensive mantras take time but one of the most powerful tools that I've ever found is chanting and uh, I have discovered I actually developed an entire online course to help and we'll do a little excerpt of it tomorrow of how to meet the planets, how to meet the chakras, how to meet the energy within yourself and how to work with it to uplift it and to bring its highest energy out. And I found in my own life that one of the easiest and fastest ways to do that is through music because it really helps to immediately change the vibration of our consciousness. And so um, we could conclude together with like a chant or two for some of the planets but um, and sort of have a little teaser, a taste of what tomorrow might be like. But um, before I do so, any other questions? Yes. Um, what is the process you bring a client through? Is it a? I'm assuming it can be a once and done and the same thing, or a process. Um, that... Yeah. So ultimately, if we were like. Um, Vulcans from Star Trek and I could just like grab you and do a Vulcan mind meld and just boom give you everything that I had it could be a one and done but the other thing is um, you grow and so the conversation that we have today might be very different from the one we have in five years and thus is the case for myself and my own mentor that you know by the grace of God the conversation that he and I are having now is different from when I was 13 and so I'm very grateful for that. But the other thing, too, is um, there are different ebbs and flows of our karma. That, as she was saying, sometimes Saturn is more prominent. And sometimes the only thing that astrologer really can do is hold your hand and weep with you and just say, like, one moment at a time. And, you know, it's not something that you usually say, but sometimes, like my astrologer told me because I was studying with him, he's like, listen, these next seven years are going to be tough. So just breathe in, breathe out be with God. And so sometimes that's what we do. But during this period of seven years, there are certain parts of my own psyche that I can't really talk about or can't really access because I'm so preoccupied with this other experience. But as soon as I get out of it, we'll be able to talk about that again. But anyway, that's that's not quite literally true in my case, or maybe it will be, we'll find out. But so the process that I undergo with my clients is, like I said, I pray a lot actually. And I look at their horoscope and I, I try and commune with the planets, and I actually I pray to them. And that sounds kind of odd, but like I said, each of us, and here's the thing, time is an illusion. Like you right now are a saint. Just we don't realize it yet. There's a part of your soul awareness which is perfect. And so before I do a reading with you, I actually try and tune into that part of the essence of who you are which already knows all the answers. Because ultimately I can't tell you anything that you don't already know. And if I tried to, you wouldn't believe me anyway. And so my goal is to tune into what do you need right now? And then I look at the chart and I ask the chart, what do you need right now? And I pray to my guru and I ask desperately to be an instrument of God's grace 
into the life of the client. And then we sit down and usually I open up by asking the simple question, how may I help you? And they will usually tell me exactly where it hurts. And that will usually determine what we end up talking about most. And just as for me personally, I usually spend about 90 minutes or a little more, a little less with someone in a particular session. My mentor sometimes will go longer than that. But really, we just try and work with the needs of the moment. And then, uh, so for example, sometimes I might look at a chart, there are nine planets. I might talk about two. or Sometimes even just one for 90 minutes or two hours. And all we're doing is trying to really discuss how to work with that energy. Because the other thing is a rising tide floats all ships. If you can, if you can plug the major hole in someone's energy, they're going to feel so much better. Or even, I don't usually try and go for the plugging the hole. I usually try and work with the strengths and say, this one virtue alone will uplift your whole life. Just work with it. Work with it and you will feel so much better. And because it's also, it's more fun to work with our strengths than to be so overly concerned with our weaknesses. And God will make good your deficiencies and make permanent your gains. So that's the way I like to work. Sometimes I'll just flow though, and we'll see, because in astrology, no planet, no man is an island, no planet is an island. They're constantly in conversation. So I can't just say that your Saturn is in Aries. I need to know what's your ascendant. I need to know where is your moon. I need to know where is the sun, where is Mars, because Mars is the Lord of Aries. And so if Mars is in Capricorn, that's a very different experience than if Mars is in Virgo, and so on and so forth. So it is a very interconnected web. The other thing is, honestly, Many people don't know astrology jargon. And so I don't need to sit here and explain to you wherever one of your planets are unless you are like want to know that for fun and for dinner table conversation, in which case I'll just send you a picture of your horoscope. But what we really do is we talk about how to improve our lives. And so then, like you said, the question is how much are we capable of absorbing now and also how much am I capable of giving right now? And then we circle back. So a typical time uh, duration for someone to see an astrologer um, would be about every year because every time you have a solar return, you can actually make a chart to indicate the progress or the, the karma that might come up in the following year, which is interesting. But also a year is a nice rhythm. It's nice to kind of get a check-in right around then. That's, I, I like to do one. I talk with my mentor more frequently, so it's always kind of in the air. But uh, I think a year is about a nice duration of time um, or a little longer. Uh, I always record my sessions, and so does my mentor, because, I, listen, I go back, I listen to things he told me when I was 13, and I'm still practicing, and it's still giving fruit. So there's a lot to be gleaned there. And, you know, this is very much dependent upon the style of astrology, because if you just went to a predictive astrologer, he'd tell you what the next six months of your life might be. And then at the end of the six months, you might want to go back. But... Um, I just had someone write to me who's been a long-term client and actually similarly to you, they said, I feel a change coming and you told me that my chart, I would have a significant change in February and it's right around the corner. Can we talk again? Sure. Or I like, I love these things. I told someone once, I just casually offhand said, you know, you might get married in like November of 2022 and they just wrote to me and they said, hey, I'm getting married in November 2022. Oh my God. So, yeah, at any rate, the frequency, I would say, really, my, my best guideline would be do it when you feel inspired. Do it when it feels like it could be useful. And don't overthink it too much. Because the other thing is, do you need an astrological reading? No. <laughs> no, no, no. But it might be useful. It might be fun. And ultimately, like I said, I can't tell you anything that you don't already know. Which is to say, if you go deep enough in your own meditation and you ask your own intuition what is right and what is good, You'll probably find the same answers in the room. That. Yeah. Clearing the stain blocks. That's right. Yeah. To kind of smile and look clear. Yeah. So then the goal of the astrologer then is to just do his homework and ask and try and develop as big of a toolkit as he can for cleaning the stained glass window. And then I might be able to recommend, you know, might I recommend the eight millimeter brush, you know, like <laughs> that's all. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that was just about our time. 
Yeah, okay, we got we got like two minutes, so we'll do a chant. <laughs> so this is a beautiful chant. This is the Maha Mantra that many of you are probably familiar with. If you're not, it's very simple. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. We'll actually begin with Hare Rama. And the reason I've selected this chant is because Rama's name is one of the mantras for the sun. And Krishna is often used as a mantra for the moon, the two most important poles in astrology. And so this sacred mantra helps to uplift the most important planets in anybody's chart, the sun and the moon, the luminaries, the source of light and self-awareness. Krishna and all forms of God bless all of us. Thank you for being here with me today. 